This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. This is episode 774. I'm your host Duncan McLeish. Welcome to the show. Up on this episode we continue our countdown of my top 10 favourite horror movies of all time with the caveat that as of October 31st 2023 this list will no longer be accurate because movies will be released etc etc. Yada yada yada. Now, it has been pointed out to me, and Bill, I hope you're watching, has been pointed out to me that the beginning of these episodes has gone into a bit of an apology tour. We ain't going to do that this time because we've hit the magical top four. And my top four horror movies have remained pretty static since about 2002. When I was like, these are my favourite four movies and yes, we will see how we get on with these. And they haven't really changed so the order sometimes changes, maybe uh, two and three swap places, or maybe three and four swap places, but for the most part, every year for the last 21, 22 years, if you ask me, pin me down, tickle me until I give up my answers, my top four favourite horror movies have been these four. So, we really are just getting into what I consider the pinnacle of of horror because this is the time I can also say that my top four favourite horror movies are actually what I consider to be the best four horror movies ever made. Once again, my opinion, but I think they are. I think the the pinnacle examples of what horror should be at its finest across the board, whether it comes to direction, acting, plot cinematography, practical effects, the the work. These movies showcase the best that the genre has to offer. So, with that introduction in mind, and uh, with very little time to waffle too much at the start, um, let me paint a little picture for you. And that picture is that mere days ago, I sat in this chair, camera, possibly at a different angle, t-shirt definitely different because otherwise I'd be smelly and I said to you that my favourite Dario Argento movie of all time was a little movie called Tenebrae. Gushed over Tenebrae, talked about how amazing it is, I genuinely love that movie. But then I said that when it comes to my favourite horror movies there is a movie that is directed by Argento which ranks above it and that kind of feels on some level kind of imbecilic to say that it doesn't make sense but in my brain it kind of does if you ask me to order my favorite or gentle movies tenebrae will come to the top if you ask me to order my favorite horror movies this one ranks above tenebrae hopefully you're with me on this one hopefully you've followed through all the mental fucking skip rope sessions that you are required to get to this point but now that you are here Visibly confused and slightly dishevelled, let me introduce you to my number four pick on my list. Ladies and gentlemen, this is when Argento turned from doing giallo to something far more supernatural. In at number four, from 1977, is Dario Argento's Suspiria. 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 
you can hide from Suspiria. Suspiria. But you cannot escape. Suspiria. The only thing more terrifying than the last 12 minutes of Suspiria are the first 92. And welcome back. So Suspiria 1977. Joining me on this review, my trusty iPad, which will soon be flung away to the side after I get through the all-important IMDb deets that I usually stumble over. Now, there are Italian names in this, which means inevitably I will stumble over, but uh, bear with me. And if you are someone who speaks fluent Italian or are really good with names or English in general, I apologise to your ears in advance. So, Suspiria, this one is directed by the maestro Dario Argento. Um, it's based on the uncredited loose idea by Thomas De Quincey. But specifically, this is written by Daria Nicolodi and Dario Argento, who co-wrote it with her. They were in a relationship at the time, um, but Daria Nicolodi is credited as having quite a lot of input, if not the vast bulk of the input in on this one, with Argento refining for the screen. The movie itself stars Jessica Harper, Stefani Cassini, Flavio Bucci, Miguel Bosi. Barbara Magnofili, that's not right, Susanna Javacoli, Eva Axon, Rudolf Schuller, Udo Kier, Aldo Viala, Joan Bennett, um, and some others are in here as well. The synopsis for Suspiria, as listed on the IMDb's R, uh, or is, an American newcomer to a prestigious German ballet academy comes to realise that the school is a front for something sinister amid a series of grisly murders. iPad is going down, ladies and gents. So, oh, Suspiria. Um, this, like, in a lot of levels, you can argue that Deep Red is the pinnacle of... Argento at his most flexed horror in that it captures everything he did at the start of his career with Bird with the Crystal Plumage, setting it the Jalo format and then kind of transitioned into a more horror tone with just the brutal killings and blood and, and all the other stuff that makes, you know, the surreal puppet coming out the corner and all the rest. A trick which he then utilises in here in a much more sinister fashion in Suspiria, but you could argue that that's, you know, that's the pinnacle of Argento and horror. I would disagree. I think Suspiria is the most horror movie Argento has ever made. And actually, I disagree with that statement. I think Inferno is the most horror movie Argento ever made. But I also think it's so abstract with its dream logic or dream delivery that it isn't as approachable as Suspiria. There, I've said it. Suspiria is the one I picked though because I think it's the one that balances so many nuances and so much fine china on top of very, very, very thin toothpicks without dropping a plate at all. Um, and at the same time, it's a movie that is unabashedly over the top from almost the opening scene. This movie is garish, it's ostentatious, it's in your face, it's loud, it's brash, it's daring you to, 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 to turn away. And you kind of can't all the way through this one. And the reason behind that is the incredible set design and cinematography. But we're going to come back to that. So Speria follows Jessica Harper, who is an American ballet student who has a one place to a very prestigious ballet academy in Germany. And of course, when she shows up, old shit is broken loose in the academy. Things are going a bit crazy as she arrives during what can only be described as a hellacious thunderstorm somehow soundtracked by Goblin who are just a witch and you're getting all this like intense music for no reason at all um, and the worst rain I mean this rain's coming in horizontal is that hellacious um, you have her arriving at the school as one of the academy is uh, essentially being kicked out 
and then dies at the hand of a gloved killer. Which I think in a lot of respects is why, why some people... I'm going to put my flag in the sand here. Misinterpret Suspiria as a giallo. It really, really isn't a giallo. If you take if you take the, like, the tick list of the top ten things that make a movie a giallo, this has maybe about four and the other six are definitely not present here. And I would argue that those other six are integral members of the giallo formula. Don't know why I did that, but that's a thing now. And you can use it in conversation when you want to upset your friends. The the glove killer is, of course, a supernatural killer. Um, and that is revealed further as you go throughout the movie. So Jessica arrives and she is getting herself all settled in, as you do, and almost instantly things are just weird, like nothing's quite right, um, she feels ill when she's dancing, the school is under a weird plague of maggots from the ceiling, people open doors to rooms filled with barbed wire, people that instruct, like piano players at the school that instruct things are attacked by their seeing eye dogs. Um, people will fall through ceilings and through glass. It is an Argental movie, so there will be at least one glass smash. Inevitably, the same way there will be a naked foot somewhere in a Tarantino movie. It's going to be there. We are all anticipating it when it arrives. No one's surprised, and you kind of just think to yourself, mm. So, Suspiria at its core is actually a movie about witchcraft, and that's what I kind of love about it. I don't think, and I'm quite confident on this, that you will be able to find a movie pre or immediately post Suspiria that deals in witchcraft that looks like this. The closest thing that comes to this is Haosu, the Japanese um, surreal uh, abstract horror movie that came out the same year. But it's not dealing specifically about witchcraft, it's dealing about like ghosts and possession and a haunted house and all the rest whereas Suspiria locks in directly on the witchcraft and I don't think you'll find it I also think there's a lot of movies inherently that try and make witchcraft a bit darker so the colour schemes are usually a bit more shadowy um, and that's by design that's how we imagine folklore has handed us down Tales of how witchcraft is handled. It's never handled any bright, vibrant uh, place surrounded by beautiful people all doing dancing and pirouettes. It's never done that way. And there's a reason it's never done that way. That in itself is kind of against the grain. Shouldn't be scary. Suspiria somehow manages to take that and add in this kind of dreamlike vibe. It was said that Argento was heavily influenced by Snow White when he made this movie. And that makes a lot of sense. The colour schemes, specifically the way certain shots are kind of anchored, even the lighting in some descriptions feels very much of that that sort of oeuvre of, of Disney. It's, you know, it's over the top, very bright, beautiful colours. Um, if a witch is performing a right, there's weird colours coming from everywhere. The lighting in this movie doesn't make a lick of sense. Like, Jessica Harper gets in a taxi at the beginning and instantly there's neon lights coming from the floor up. That doesn't make sense, but it adds to its charm and it's almost, even the way the movie finishes, kind of feels like the conclusion of a dream. If someone wanted to hypothesise and argue that Suspiria in its entirety, its full runtime, is one elongated dream held by, you know, like a fever dream by uh, Jessica Harper's character, I could believe that. It's, you know, I, I would want to read all the writing based on it, but I could believe that you would come to that conclusion because things are so surreal and they, they lend themselves to dream logic in such a way. The way I've always described dream logic is that it's probably the easiest way because my dreams are like this and I don't dream much, but when I do, they are weird. But in a dream, you're in a place that you know. You might be in this room if you've been in this room before, and you go to open the door, and your brain knows what's on the other side of that door. There's a hallway on the other side of that door. But when you go across and open that door, you walk into a room that is not the room you expect. But in your dream, your brain goes with it as if that was always on the other side of the door, and it wasn't actually the hallway that your brain yourself knows should have been a hallway. But you just go with it, and you carry on. That's dream logic to me. 
like when a character does something that like in The Shining where like the the rooms don't make sense and the layout doesn't make sense to me in part that feels like dream logic it's something that embeds itself in your subconscious because that's what your dreams are it's your subconscious communicating messages to you it's processing stuff that you've went through that day that week that month um, or whatever sometimes likes to regurgitate things from a while ago um, I've told the story before but the last broadcast I remember seeing that when it came out in the video store I remember watching it once and then never watching it again and then about four years later non-stop for about a week week and a half every single night I dreamt about the last broadcast uh, until I bought it and then the dream stopped and I don't know what it was that was going on in my life that my brain said you know what we're going to pull this memory from four years ago and we're just going to hit replay on it until he buys it don't know but that's that's dream logic to me it's jumps in logic that to the character's viewpoint should not make sense but the character continues on with it regardless and Suspiria is full of that I mentioned before there's a particular scene in this one where a character who is trying to escape opens a door and falls directly into a room full with barbed wire and that room shouldn't exist. There's no reason for a room like that to exist unless it's a spell or it's some sort of bizarre dream where the worst thing the person imagining that dream could think of was a room filled with barbed wire. The the characters in this as well, the, the, the actual staff, whether it's the old lady with the angelic kid and she herself looks like a crone from something like a Snow White, um, or you know that the the actual dancing troupe themselves, you know the 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 kind of the teachers, the the management staff, the people that run the academy, all feel like different drawings or caricatures of of kind of powerful crone like witches. Um, none of them are overtly attractive. They save that for the, the young, fresh, nouvelle faces of those that attended dance school. And it's a really cool juxtaposition that just works with it. Um, there is, I got the 4K UHD recently. In fact, I've had it for years, but I only opened it recently in preparation for this list. And I played it. And the, the wonderful shot of when Jessica Harper is walking down the corridor and um, the old woman sitting there with the the glass object and she reflects the light off it and it hits her eyes and the the 4k restoration of this shows up every speck of dust that's in the air apparently very dusty set by the looks of things and everything was so pristine that i felt i felt myself feeling that 4k specifically uhd but 4k is finally catching up with how argento wanted the movie to look how he was seeing things in real life and I think that's one of the as we go on movies with a look and a vibe one of the most gorgeous movies you'll ever see every set in this one looks like a picture it's it's phenomenal I imagine a lot of them are painted but um, like hotels rooms um, even the exterior shots of which there aren't many in this movie are shot in very beautiful locations in Rome which just adds to that as well and just across the board is a stunning looking film and then that's before you start getting into all the death in this one it really doesn't hold back on this one if anything all you get is a continuation of incredible set piece incredible design um, and incredible gore that garish red blood that Argento loves so much kind of evoking the memory of kind of 60s hammer horror films is a wash over this movie um like the very first kill in this one of the woman having her throat grabbed and then slit and then kind of falling backwards through or being choked and then falling backwards through the stained glass ceiling because it's Argento and everything has to be vibrant it's so inherently overkill and brutal it's just wonderful to look at you add on top of that the vicious dog death. You add on top of that the you know the the incredible death at the end. Um, what I love there's a particular glass smash scene uh, later on where a character dies um, uh, in barbed wire and broken glass, and that character then comes back using the same scare 
as used in Deep Red, which is the from the side of the room. In the case of this one, the door opening and her coming in, eyes wide open as a kind of quasi zombie, um, with a weird laugh and all the rest. And it's just jarring to look at. It look like the cuts look real. It looks sore. It looks visceral. There's something primal about it. It just looks gnarly. It's weird. It's just inherently weird. If all those things weren't enough, you get arguably one of the best uh, scores by Goblin ever on top of this one. Um, the Suspiria score is like chef's kiss good. It's kind of folksy, it's tribal, it's got that kind of paganistic ceremonial sound kicking in with it. But then on top of that, you've got that kind of weird prog rocky, rocky thing that Goblin do so well. Strange, bizarre synthy sounds that kind of weave over the top. Um, and oh, the tracks elongate out, they prolong the experience for you, which I absolutely love. I think that the way the score, the soundtrack settles on the movie in parts is just spot on and Argento seemed to have a lot of luck when utilising a uh, goblin on his scores what you would get is that specific feeling that vibe that that goblin were almost at the side of him and he's going like well this scene is going to run for like four minutes guys and they're like all right we'll play four minutes dario and then they would just get on with it it just syncs up perfectly the Suspiria score has been used umpteen times on other movies not within the movie but when directors want to convey what a scene should feel like, Suspiria gets played in the background, which I think is testament to how ahead of the curve that score was. And coming off the back of Deep Red, some two years before, creating an iconic score for that one, I think they outdo themselves on this one. I would actually go one step further and say, as Goblin exists as a band and a unit, this is my favourite Goblin score. And that's including all the alternate scores they did for things like... Um, Dawn of the Dead etc or even Patrick I think this is the one that just fits most majestically with the movie overall Argento does this movie and it's a huge international success everyone loves it everyone's on board everyone's digging the vibe they're digging this new Argento this guy who's kind of who's stepping away from the crime murder genre and moving it to something overtly horror just like throwing caution to the wind and Ian M says that it's actually part of a trilogy. And the next one is going to be Inferno, which he does some three years later. Uh, and then Inferno comes out. And you would think everyone would be like, yay. And Inferno came out. And once again, a, a critical success in terms of um, how much money it brought in. I mean, it was very financially successful. I suppose I should say financially successful over critically successful. Um, but it doesn't really set the world on fire critically and as a result of that he gets a bit nervous and does Tenebrae next which is his return to Jallo um, which is his bread and butter. Every time Argento makes a misstep or something he perceives as a misstep he falls back on what he knows best. A lot of directors do that. If you look at M. Night Shyamalan he had a string of pretty bad movies um, kind of culminating on he did that movie with Will Smith and Will Smith's son where they were like on an alien planet and they couldn't show emotion and that movie bombed and that was at the, the height of Will Smith's like power and that movie bombed and off the back of that a string of like not successful movies he went back and did The Visit a small insular horror movie where you could control things and put a twist in and that formula worked for him and look at him now he's that's him back to doing those movies he tried to step too far away couldn't look at someone like Brian De Palma Bonfire of the Vanities comes off the back of The Untouchables which you know is like Oscar ridden movie and he's like yeah look at me I'm De Palma um, I'm going to go and make this Bonfire of the Vanities project and I'm it's going to be universally hated it's going to be panned by everyone and so I will bring out Raising Cain as my answer to that because Raising Cain is one of those Hitchcockian thrillers that I can just spin up whenever I want and people expect that from me. Like, directors have a comfort zone that they move back into and when they move back into it, the world is all right. And they've all had that. Like, people like Wes Craven, Toby Hooper, Steven Spielberg. Like, directors have that comfort zone and Argento is the same. Weirdly, though, I think Inferno 
out of his entire back catalogue is the one that I think improves over time. It weirdly feels like if that movie came out today and was on like E24, it would be absolutely massive. Uh, it just has that feel, that vibe. It's even more dreamlike, but yeah, it's got a goofy ending. It feels a bit rushed, probably was a bit rushed, but I love it for that. And you get no Inferno without in Suspiria. Um, you know, he's, he's a mother of tears, his final one in the, in the Three Mothers trilogy. It's not a terrible movie. I know some people think it is. I think it's it's fine. I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, warts and all, because it's a witch movie. But, I mean, it's not a patch on the original two. Too much time had passed, and you never really got that sense of satisfaction, which is the ultimate frustration of the remake of Suspiria. I think the remake of Suspiria by, uh, what's his name? Luca Guadido? Guanino? can't remember his surname, Luca. Um, I think it's incredible. I absolutely loved it. I thought he did the right thing by not trying to make Argento Suspiria and making his own one. I think weirdly, by inverting the colour scheme and doing all the stuff that he did and grounding it more in a 70s vibe and adding the context of the, the Berlin Wall, etc. in the background, was like just genius manoeuvring as a director. And it finished, and I was like, right, let's modern three mothers give me the movie in the 80s with um, Inferno and give me something like go like Amazon Studios, you've got all the money in the world. And we never got it, we probably never will get it, which is an immense frustration to me because I would have said for the longest time Suspiria is the most difficult movie to remake. Like, like the balls in any director who even tries to take his swing at making a remake of Suspiria and it landed and it was really fucking good so if that could have been done imagine what other kind of more arty directors out there that could take their stab at it I, I would look like if, if there was ever a chance of an Ari Aster like remake of Inferno I might just jizz in my pants I'll be honest Suspiria as a whole is just incredible like getting through that movie for the very first time and being at the end of it and getting that big logo, you have been watching Suspiria. Um, and you're like, yeah, I have. I'm like, fucking high five in the person beside you. Um, it has that kind of weird, bizarre, dreamlike, almost like fairground feel to it where everything's just off a little bit. It's like a weird fun house. It's like staring in the magic mirror room and you see yourself and you recognize yourself, but everything's just a little bit off. That's Suspiria. Is it the scariest movie ever made? No. Did it scare me when I watched it? Actually, no. I was never scared by Suspiria. Even as a kid, I was never scared by Suspiria. But it painted pictures of a world and, a, and an idea which got inside my brain. It's that woozy feeling that you get when you wake up and you know you've had a nightmare but you can't recall what was in the dream or what it was that made you unsettled. That's Suspiria. Um... It's, it's an incredible movie and it will I can't imagine a time where it ever leaves my top four favourite movies um, I think it's I think it's I think it's his best it's not my favourite but I think it's his best I think he didn't necessarily peak at that because Tenebrae is amazing and Inferno is amazing and Phenomena is a great movie and I really like opera. So he went on and did some great stuff in the late 80s. But I get the feeling that when Suspiria came out, it was kind of almost like he felt that he'd done that and he didn't need to come back and do it again. And that's why Inferno was so like off to the side of it. It's a weird one. I would love to find out why? <laughs> what? That's just the question. Hello, Mr. Argento. It's a pleasure to meet you. Why? Um, it's, it's, it's insane. I love it so much. Uh, but it comes in at number four. And I know to some people, it's a sacrilege to have Suspiria number four on your list. But you know what? I'm doing it because to me, there are three movies I prefer above it that I actually think are better horror movies. And we're going to get to them over the next three days as we roll in to my 10th anniversary of Podcasts Under the Stairs. 
So thank you very much for checking out this review. If you've been following us on the YouTube, so watching this as a video, thank you very much for your support. Do me a little favour, hit subscribe. That way you get more video content as and when we drop it, like the next three days when you get more video reviews. And leave a comment as well. I'm loving interacting with people. So if you love Suspiria, tell me you love Suspiria. If you don't like Suspiria, tell me why you don't like Suspiria. Let's keep the dialogue going. It is always fun to hear from you guys. If you're checking us out on Spotify, using either the video or the podcasting app there, then answer the question, which is the same thing. What do you think of Suspiria? Let me know there as well and then lastly if you're capturing me on any of the podcatchers out there and you're listening to me right now on a commute or whatnot make sure you subscribe to that feed as well and that way you get all the episodes plus the over 1200 episodes that we have um somewhere in the podcast universe uh just waiting for you to listen so please do that as well all that's left for me to say is thanks very much for checking out this video wherever you are whatever the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours Please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off.